Soil isn't something many of us think about on a daily basis, but it's the foundation on which we build our homes, raise our animals and grow 95% of our food. But it also regulates water levels and captures vast quantities of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. The problem is, we've been systematically mistreating our soil for decades, with deadly consequences. And time is running out to save our soils. In this video, we're going to discuss five key agricultural factors in soil erosion and how, with a little tender love and care, only 0.4% per year, we could undo the damage done and end the war on soil. Firstly, a big shout out to Bilbo Swaggins and Kieran Pringer, who became supporters of this channel and our first ever Patreons. The soil beneath our feet is composed of a multitude of interacting constituents. It contains organic compounds derived from living material, water, gases, minerals, and a quarter of the world's biodiversity, comprising plants, insects, and microorganisms. In fact, in a handful of healthy soil, there are more microorganisms than people who have ever lived. And there are as many varieties of soil as you can possibly imagine. But this doesn't mean that soil is infinite, especially arable topsoil. Since the Industrial Revolution, humans have been steadily eroding away topsoil in a process known as desertification, which now affects two thirds of the world's surface. While there are many human factors affecting soil erosion, ironically, farming, an industry dependent on soil, is often the chief culprit, as farmland represents 40% of the world's surface. We're of course not here to blame farmers, who have always acted to make the most of their land, but much like the effects of farming on bee populations we discussed in a previous video, the causes of soil loss are multifaceted and interacting, making them difficult to overcome. Fortunately, modern science and the use of satellites has enabled us to see these causes and effects in clarity, as well as provided us more sustainable ways to manage farmland. We'll cover these practices towards the end of this video. Number one, agricultural inputs. Agricultural inputs are the materials added to crops to enhance crop growth and reduce disease. These include herbicides, fungicides, pesticides, and both artificial and natural fertilizers. Many of these are chemical mixtures developed during wartime to increase farming efficiency when food imports were restricted and some fields turned into battlegrounds. While they serve their purpose during times of great upheaval, these chemicals do not contribute to sustainable agriculture. Pesticides, which kill off crop-eating insects, also kill beneficial insects, microflora and bacteria in the soil. These organisms are critical for new plant growth, as they break down rotting material to release fresh nutrients and glue-like aggregates, which give the soil strength, structure and water retention. Herbicides, like glyphosate, also known as Roundup, kill off invasive weeds and other plant species, but they can also kill off earthworms, a species vital for soil health. Artificial fertilizers may produce higher crop yields in the short term, but will also change the soil's chemical composition, pH, and porosity. By favoring some flora and fauna over others, these changes can create positive feedback cycles, which drive the need for even more agrochemicals. Mineral fertilizers may increase levels of fungi, which in turn creates the need for fungicide. These kill the organisms which draw down nutrients into the soil and drives the need for yet more fertilizers. Many agrochemicals are also bad for us. During World War II, insecticides such as DDT were used to kill mosquitoes, saving millions of lives from being lost to malaria. But DDT accumulated in the soil and the food chain, eventually causing human cancers, leading to it being banned. As LG Copping points out, today we have choices about the insecticides we can use. In 1945, we did not. The chemicals which once enriched our crops now force us to use more chemicals than ever to mask the problem of degraded soils. Number two, monocultures. Most farms grow monocultures, fields upon fields of the same crop species. But in the natural world, living species cannot survive in this way. Plants are the mouth of the soil, feeding it the specific nutrients they absorb or produce. So monoculture plantations provide a limited diversity of nutrient cycling. This in turn restricts the growth of other plant species, harms the variety of microbes and insects which live amongst the soil, 
and limits food for pollinators, birds and small mammals. The lack of a diverse microbiome reduces soil glue and overall health, encourages certain weeds and drives the need for increasing amounts of herbicides and fertilisers. Monocultures are also more affected by swings in crop pricing, crop disease and freak weather events, which ultimately harms the farmers as it balances their income on a knife edge. So why do we grow them? In most countries, modern agricultural law promotes large taxpayer funded crop subsidies to farming conglomerates to ensure a supply of common varieties of fruits, vegetables, feed for animals, and in turn, animal products. Many animal feeds such as soy, corn, and hay would otherwise be financially unviable. In some nations, farmers are paid regardless of how much product goes to market, only how much they plant. So the drive for monoculture plantations often stems from misplaced financial incentives and poor environmental protection. Next, lack of crop cover. Harvesting a crop is typically done just once a year, and in the case of monocultures, over many acres of land at a time. During harvesting, some crops are pulled straight from the ground, removing intricate root systems which hold the soil together. Other crops are cut down to the base with heavy machinery and vast manual labour. When this is done, the lack of leaf coverage allows the soil to heat up and dry out in sunlight. Similar effects are seen when land is overgrazed by livestock, it's this loss of structure and moisture content that allows soils to be eroded by wind and rain. Simultaneously, the lack of crop cover causes colder overnight temperatures and increased plant death by frostbite. But it gets worse. About 40% of rainfall comes from land-based water through the evaporation of water bodies or transpiration from plants. So the lack of crop cover limits rainfall production and the hotter bare soil and air temperatures push rain clouds away creating another positive feedback cycle which enhances drought and progresses desertification. Worse still, these processes are exacerbated by another man-made disaster, climate change. Climate change increases land surface temperatures, moisture loss and soil sterilisation. About 40% of carbon absorbed by crops is sent into the roots in a process known as biosequestration. So in yet another disastrous positive feedback cycle, the breakdown of soil re-releases this CO2 into the atmosphere, leading to increased global temperatures and freak weather events, such as storms and hurricanes, which further erode soil. These effects can be seen at vast scales during harvest season using satellite imagery, while the opposite is seen when new crops are planted. This microclimate level of destruction worldwide has huge implications for the macroclimate. Check out our video on satellite remote sensing to see how these kinds of data are gathered. Number five, finally, the greatest threat to soil, plowing and tilling. Plowing and tilling use heavy farming machinery to overturn soil in order to sow seeds and have been major culprits in soil erosion for generations. The top layer of soil is often the richest in organic matter and nutrients, and much like removing leaf coverage or overgrazing, plowing and tilling expose the topsoil to increased oxygen levels, sunlight, wind and rainfall, which break down and wash away vital organic matter. The loss of organic matter and moisture turns healthy soil into dust and dirt, dry and biologically inactive powders. The lack of nutrients and microbes in tilled soils, as well as compaction by farming vehicles, leads to reduced pore space, making soil less able to hold water and harbour life. Around the world, farmland losses are leading to increased flooding, droughts, job losses, social breakdown, and extremist recruitment. As Alan Savory points out, poor land leads to poor people. About 40 million people a year migrate from desertification, but by 2050, this is predicted to reach 1 billion. So what can be done to halt the attrition of our life-giving soils? Plowing and tilling can be phased out for alternative machinery, such as no-till plows, which use crop residues to cover newly sown seeds Today, 40% of crops in the US are grown on no-till land, 60% are not. Monocultures can be phased out for a greater variety of crops, and cover crops can be planted between harvests or crop rows. Cover crops improve soil health and crop production by augmenting the variety of nutrients drawn down into the soil and the variety of pollens available for pollinators. Cover crops also provide shade and transpiration to reduce soil drought and provide roots which fix the soil in place. 
Farmers can also plant a variety of crops in rotation, so harvests happen more regularly in smaller batches and generate more seasonal food per land area. For additional soil protection, farmers can plant border trees and hedgerows, which also absorb CO2, and provide homes for birds, insects and small mammals, mimicking the natural biodiversity of nature. Such practices can seem financially punishing, but as soil expert Dr Ray Archuleta says to every farmer he meets, if you get the ecology, the economics will come. But what about already depleted soils? While intensive cattle farms are often seen as culprits in climate change, roaming grazers are essential for restoring natural environments, soil and capturing CO2, as they fertilise the land through manure and urine. Farmers can also combat climate change directly by drawing down more carbon into their soil with natural fertilisers like legumes, peas and peanuts. The implementation of drawdown practices in the US has led to an increase in soil carbon storage of up to 3 tonnes per acre per year. But we can do better. If farmers adopted more soil saving practices, carbon sequestration could reach as much as 33 tonnes per acre, which is as much as a petrol car emits during its lifetime. By replicating this globally, we would only need a 0.4% per year increase in soil carbon content to absorb the equivalent of all of humanity's CO2 emissions for that year. This could reduce the one teratonne of CO2 currently stuck in our atmosphere and even lead to global cooling within 20 years, assuming we continue our global transition to renewable energy. All of these options can be summarised in one simple term, eco-mimicry. The goal of farming should be to work with nature, not against it. Cover crops should mimic the natural flora of the land, while cattle act as natural grazing herds, which disseminate fertilised seeds and moisture to the soil. But what can you do about soil loss? If you want to help fight soil erosion at home, here's five easy tips you can follow right now. Number one, if you have a garden, look after your soil by avoiding herbicides, pesticides and artificial fertilisers and by planting a diverse range of wildflowers, seeds, bushes, trees and seasonal produce. This will also really help out bees and other pollinators. Number two, create your own compost heap and make sure to fill your food waste bin provided by your local council. Number three, try to buy organic, local and seasonal produce from shops and farmers markets to encourage sustainable agriculture. Number four, demand that your government signs and abides by the COP21 pledge to increase soil organic carbon content by talking to your local political representative about it. But don't just take our word for it. If you want to learn more about regenerative soil management, check out the award-winning documentary Kiss the Ground, which inspired this video. Thanks for watching this R Eden video. This was a huge topic to summarise and we hope we did it justice. If you liked it, please give us a like and click subscribe. If there's anything we missed, we're sure you guys will let us know in the comments. And as always, look after yourselves, each other, and most importantly, the planet around you. Thanks again, R Eden. If you want to support the content R Eden makes, be sure to check out our Patreon by clicking on screen or in the link below. Here you'll get early ad-free access to our videos, hear our audio bloopers, and be able to donate 10% of your subscription to a charity of your choice.